Well, I reckon to say one of the problems that we have in the modern day is that there's not really any barrier to entry into being in an elite position. The only barrier to entry being, well, who do you know, right? And then also, is there some sort of test or test of strength or test of virtue for you to be able to hold that position, right? Because the issue is, is that typically when an empire or a society is at its height, that means that um, it's probably going to go on a decline. Either it's going to go on a, a very sharp decline or it's going to be on a gradual decline. And say what you want about the U.S. especially, because I can only speak from that perspective culturally. I guess I can speak from Japanese too, but I'm going to speak from American from this standpoint. Um, clearly, society or clearly our culture is on a decline, right? And so I think what's good to observe is what does a healthy society look like or what does a healthy culture look like as it's on the ascent? And so I'm going to use this book again as an example. This one part that he talked about, can I see that there? Yeah. This one part that he talked about um, really just completely blew my mind. Um, so you think of the Romans, right? And you think of the Roman, like, you know, the whole thing of like patrician versus pleb. You probably think to yourself, okay, um, there must have been this huge wealth inequality between the patricians and the plebs uh, and the plebeians. They're in the Roman Republic. That actually could not be further from the truth. Actually, according to Turchin, um, back during the Roman Republic, when Hannibal was invading Italy, the wealth inequality between the uh, the patricians, so the highest class, the senators especially, and then um, sort of like the wealthy peasants, so the wealthiest of the plebs, was only like 10 to 1 or something like that. The wealth inequality really wasn't that high. And then more importantly, let's put that aside. That's just sort of a um, kind of a unintended consequence of the sort of societal structure that they had. Really, what I think is really impressive about the Roman Republic is that the senators themselves, the actual, the highest up in society, had a lot of responsibilities put on them um, in the form of potential death. What I mean is, is that these senators themselves would actually go off to war and they would fight in battle. Now imagine, imagine if our politicians nowadays had to go into battle themselves when they're saying, when they're trying to like wage wars or do whatever else, obviously they don't, they send other people to go to war, right? So there's this very uh, famous battle where Rome actually got slaughtered by Hannibal. They lost like 80,000 soldiers or something crazy like that. In ancient times, that's like equivalent to losing like a million men uh, in battle nowadays, maybe even more, disproportionately speaking. But a large portion of the people who died were senators inside of that battle. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Can you just imagine like freaking, uh, I don't know, like Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi going into battle at their age? <laughs> It's just a crazy thing to think about. Um, but but yeah, so there is real stake in the game for the people in power back then. You know what I mean? And so I think part of the problem is, and one of the things that Nietzsche is correct to point out is that hierarchies are inevitable. He always talks about hierarchies um, and how there's always orders of rank, right? In Beyond Good and Evil, the last section, What is Noble, which is uh, a section I've been focusing on a lot lately in my videos, he always talks about how orders, orders of rank, there's always orders of rank. And so if the people, and this is where I think a lot of people mis misinterpret Nietzsche, or I think it's a weird interpretation of him, because I think he actually sort of in a way explicitly says differently than people say that he does, I guess. But a lot of people think, oh, well, Nietzsche just thinks that there's masters and slaves and the slaves are contemptible and they're terrible and they should just rot their scum of the earth. And the masters are amazing and cool. <laughs> like, that's a really reductive way to look at him. Instead, what he's kind of saying is, is that orders of rank are inevitable and you need to put the right people inside of those orders of rank. Um, he has a, a short aphorism, one of his short, short aphorisms, uh, again, in, in Beyond Good and Evil, he says, in affability, uh, there's too much contempt for humanity. Meaning that if you're too nice, if you're um, 
if you can't be a bit harder on people, right? And one of the things in which you could be harder on people was orders of rank being like, no, you're not worthy. You're not good enough to be in this position. So you shouldn't be there, right? You should be down here. So kind of in a way, the way that I interpret him is that we need to have the right people in charge. Those right people in charge lead everyone else to victory, right? It is sort of like the great man theory thing, but um, just look across history. I mean, do you really, do you ever learn about people who didn't, who were just followers? No, but do you necessarily, did the, were those followers required to make those great men, men's accomplishments happen? Of course, right? Who was Alexander without his army? Who was Julius Caesar without his army? Who was Napoleon without his army? You know, it's like these great men needed these followers, but there were orders of rank. And because of that, they were able to succeed. Okay. And so what matters is making sure that we have the right people in positions of power. Nowadays, we do not have that. We definitely have weak people in positions of power, people who have never been to war, people who have, um, who really just have no stake in the game at all, right? They can just sign something and just, you know, print a bunch of money and whatnot, but because they're protected based off of our government structure, then they don't care, <laughs> you know? And so the United States especially was supposed to be modeled off of the Roman Republic, not the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire, there's a huge wealth inequality between the senators and the low class. And that eventually led to them, you know, declining and, and wearing out. Whereas the Roman, although technically the Roman Empire was more powerful than the Roman Republic, a lot of it was built off of the shoulders of all the work that was done during the Roman Republic, right? Um, so again, the, the Roman Republic, the senators had more stake in the game, you know? And so I think that's one thing to highly consider is that weak men create a weak culture, a weak society, if they are in positions of power, which is inevitable. Okay. One of the reasons I talk about history a lot is because um, it's a lot easier to be kind of objective about what's happening there, especially if you're not living in it. And especially if you believe that human beings are an animal and as an animal, our behaviors can be pretty predictable, especially in a large population. Um, and, you know, 2000 years evolutionarily, 2000 years ago, it's not like a long amount of time, right? Uh, behaviors, the way that people are can actually be quite predictable. All right. So that's one of the reasons why. And actually, a guy I've been mentioning a lot in my streams and my videos, Martin Heidegger, he actually talks about how when you're critiquing or not critiquing, but when you're introspecting or looking at something, you can actually be blinded if the thing is way too close to you, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, I think one of the examples that he gives is like, or just think of it this way, you know, if there's a, if there's like a speck of dust on your hair, you know, okay, technically that's right there, but you can't see it. Other people have to see it for you. So it could be something similar of not a speck of dust or a speck of hair, a speck of dust. So it's a similar thing when it comes to history and cultural analysis is that if it's hard to analyze the culture that you are brought up in, and you are just inherently a part of because you're inside of it. It's impossible for you to observe, let's just say, the, the maze that you're in. And it's a lot easier to look up above and then look down at the maze, right? So that's kind of what we're doing when we observe places like the Roman Empire, for example. So so we we covered the uh, did the weak, did weak men create a weak culture? In the Roman Empire, that does seem to be what happened where, you know, we you had a bunch of strong men who had all the the most elite men, the the most at the top of society. All of these guys had so much skin in the game. They had to be strong. They had to be strong enough to the point where they would go fight in battle, right? Even after they have attained their top positions. And nowadays, and this is like such a, this isn't just modern history. This is even like the past few thousand years, I would say it's become kind of weird for like a king or uh, royalty to go into battle with their troops on the front lines, right? That's kind of almost unheard of now, <laughs> right? And that's why they're also so much um, more willing to send other people, right? And so with the Roman Empire, anyway, the Roman Empire, um, gradually, as they became more successful, um, there was less conflict, there was less things that they had to do, there's less of a frontier, and they had to manage more things. 
And over time, it became less and less important to have actual really strong, virtuous people in powers of in positions of power. And that's why, like with the Roman Empire, they had the the five great emperors uh, at that period of time, the Pax Romana, which ended with Marcus Aurelius. And then after that, uh, you had Commodus, who was terrible. You know, they actually show that in the in the movie Gladiator, although it's not the most historically accurate, but they did have him there. <laughs> um, and then they had a few kind of good emperors here and there, but it was nothing ever long lasting. Anything that they did do, somebody else undid. And um, the Roman Empire basically just became too big, um, but then also it became too weak. It became too decadent, you know, across generations, across like basically 200 years. Um, you know, if you have no reason to have strong people in power, then you're going to have weak people in power. The weak people are going to make things worse. And that's what happened in the Roman Empire, right? And so... But in the modern day, it's very interesting because I think we just kind of assume, you know, with with how things are going and how the economy is all fucked and um, politics is all fucked and whatnot, that we just think like, oh, the culture or whatever, or like that, um, you know, weak men might have caused this, but it's not us, <laughs> Right. Have you ever considered the thought that maybe we were brought up to be weak? You know, how about that? Like, I think a lot of times people just like blame the boomers. And yes, the boomers deserve a lot of blame for a lot of stuff. But I, I don't really know if like our generation or especially Gen Z is any better. Um, I don't necessarily think that we're worse either. But I really do think that we were a lot of us were set up to fail. And the reason that we were set up to fail is because we were brought up in an environment in a world that was just a little bit too cushy, a little bit too easy. Um, you know, the participation trophy generation, right? <laughs> like, um, I mean, that was a thing even when I was a kid. Like, luckily, I was um, my my daddy's like this uh, really like like type A, you know, workaholic dude from Oklahoma you know, worked his ass off, went to, you know, lived in Japan, worked at a company there because he wanted to, and then even went to an Ivy League school later. So like really ambitious guy, right? So with him, he's like, nah, dude, that's not how life works. Like, I'll throw your participation trophy away. <laughs> he only wanted me to celebrate when I actually got like a real trophy that I earned, which is good. I was able to adopt that mentality. But, you know, imagine that you had a parents that didn't do that, right? And then, you just adopted that mindset from a young age. And as kids, we're basically like, we're like a sponge, right? Or we're like, um, that's like a sponge. It's sort of like, if you look at like an onion, you know, the, 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 no, maybe not onion. Let's say a tree, you know, you know how a tree has rings. So like the innermost rings, um, imagine that those are developed by having these like shitty ideas and the shitty way of viewing the world from a young age, which isn't your fault at all, right? Because you're not matured and developed yet. And then how do you think the tree is going to form afterwards? It's probably going to fuck it up a bit, right? And so like, imagine you adopt that mentality of like, I'm special. I can be whatever I want when I grow up. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, it doesn't matter if I win or lose. All that matters is, you know, that I had fun. And I think with us, like, we can't help but, like, flagellate ourselves. Because I do think that we're a weak generation. Us, Gen Z, um, some people are less weak than others, I guess. But we still have all of these sort of ideas that are a reflection of a decadent society. As in, especially after World War II, and this is why the, the boomers get so much blame, is the um, everything was, like, so good after that because America was on top. There was nobody else that was in charge of America. America after World War II basically owned the world. Okay. Um, and they, you could arguably say that they still do. And, but especially within that time, the economy, everything was so amazing and whatnot, right? There was no need for conflict. There's no need to raise hard men. Right? It's almost like the seeds for what nihilism that we go through as a generation of young men have, were sort of sown back when times were better that makes sense better, right?
Um, it's almost like they were reaping the harvest of past times while failing to plant the seeds for the future, you know? And part of that is because not raising their kids to be tough does not raise them to strive for greatness um, because there's no need to. Why would you put the effort into going through the crucible of achievement if you have all your basic needs met already? They're, the people dying for a cause should be the people also doing the commanding themselves, right? Ideally. And that's why I brought up the, the Roman senators who died at the Battle of Cani. Um, they should also have skin in the game as well. And part of the problem is that modern elites do not have any skin in the game at all. They just send other people's children to war to die, <laughs> right? Anyway, thanks so much for watching, guys. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.